Hello, I'm Norman Edwards, and I'm here teaching the Bible. I'm making videos for the purpose of encouraging you to help you understand the purpose for your life, the purpose for all mankind in general, and what we're doing here in this often rather difficult world. You can use these teachings however you find yourself right now, whether you're just wondering, is there a God or not, and how does that work? or whether you're maybe trying to change your life to more line up with God's purpose, or whether you've been a lifelong believer and are still studying the Bible, or whether you're from a different religion altogether but want to know what the Bible says. Maybe only a sentence will help you. For others, maybe several videos will be a game changer. And still for others, you might want to watch the whole channel. It's up to you. But my plan is to take on the big questions of life and answer them from the Bible. Of course, the first question we probably are going to ask is, what is the purpose of life? How did we get here? Is this some special creation of God? Or are we just a product of evolution, of natural selection, since we got here from random events? Of course, today, nearly all institutions of higher learning teach that we are the product of evolution. And what's their proof? There are 50 million unique species here living on Earth, so they must have gotten here somehow. But in spite of numerous efforts, biologists have been unable to ever actually make a species evolve. Yet in fields of engineering and technology and mathematics, nobody believes in evolution as an effective means of getting anything done. And you probably don't really believe in it either. Now you just maybe haven't thought about it like this. Supposing something went wrong with your car and you needed a part, or there was just no auto parts store around, it was late, they were closed, you know, something had gone wrong and you needed to get this car going very badly. You think about that, well, given a long time and billions of years, there might have been some plates of the earth moving around and a piece of metal might have gotten stuck in between the two and rolled just right and produced a bolt. It's exactly five eighths inches this way and has teeth on it that are exactly 11 threads per inch and is the right length about three and a half inches long and has a head that you can get a wrench on. We all know stuff like that doesn't happen. That if there were random forces of nature, it would be more likely to mess up a perfectly round thing than make it. We know that. We do. But yet, there's people who believe that the exact opposite process has happened and that gradually life was built and improved and the random forces of nature didn't just destroy it. For example, this bolt has maybe only six, ten parameters. How long, how wide, how many threads per inch, how deep the threads are, and maybe some parameters on the head. You know, maybe seven, ten things or something that have to be just right for it to work. Well, living cells might have what? A decillion parameters? All the different proteins and things and how they're arranged, the DNA, the RNA in them. A decillion is one with 33 zeros. But I mean they are just that specific. There is that much information. We've never been able to make a living cell from scratch. We've been able to reprogram the DNA. Scientists are brilliant. But as far as making a cell, no. Before a cell existed, there was no such thing as reproduction or natural selection. There was no way for the characteristics of a living thing to weed themselves out and to have the good ones selected and the bad ones discarded. There was no life. But somehow, all of those things had to all get going. And given a long, long time, still doesn't help it get going. Any more than you believe you can find something like this just because the Earth is four or six billion years old. No, we know that somebody made this. It was an intelligent person who designed to make probably hundreds or millions of them to a certain specification that will fit machines or whatever that need a bolt of this size. If these threads aren't exactly the right number of threads per inch, they won't screw in to the nut that they're supposed to go into. But this is just incredibly simple compared to any sort of living thing. But if we ignore where that first cell came from, and we just keep going, and we try to say, all right, let's say there was natural selection from there, and how did we develop complex life? The billions, possibly, or 
millions certainly, of species that are here. Could random mutations and natural selection account for the complexity and the diversity that we see? I really don't think so. My proof, my simple evidence, of course this would make a great much longer video, is uh, consider a complex computer program, operating system, word processor, whatever you use, game. Does anybody seriously go and expect random mutations to go and improve it? There are some pieces of software that actually have a way to create an install disk or install a file or whatever that will take everything that's in that program, whatever changes have been made, and put an install file that somebody else can go install on their computer. Okay, so does anybody like hope that they have disk errors, memory errors, communication failures or whatever, so that they will get some changes in this program and maybe by passing around copies of it, there will be some natural selection and improvements will be made to the games. You'll get new characters or new software capabilities. Does anybody do that? Rely on that? I mean, hey, and we could pass these programs around to millions or billions of people and nobody does that because they all know that 99.99999% of those random fluctuations and variations are going to make it worse. And they don't want to sift through, you know, millions of bad versions to get one possibly better one. It's just unreasonable. And no matter how long we were here, and even at the speed of computers, no, nobody does that. If you have a piece of software that's not working or needs a new feature, you want some expert who knows exactly how it works to design a new piece of software that will do exactly what you want. That's the way it goes. That's the way it's always been. There's nobody anywhere who goes and says, hey, look at the world. There's 30, 50 million, some people say, others as high as billions or even a trillion from the University of Indiana. There's that many species in the world. This evolution thing must work great. Let's just go and do random fluctuations and then kind of sort them out by natural selection. Nobody does that to get anything to work. Nobody does it to get a simple thing as a bolt. They design what they want and they go after it. This creation versus evolution issue is one of the most important issues of our time, and we should never let it escape us. We should always be conscious of this creation versus evolution question when we make the decisions that so vitally affect our lives. If there's not an answer to that, it's really hard to expect anything or any way to figure out what we should do next. If we're created in God's image, then we have a purpose. We have a right to life. And it is wrong to deprive others of their purpose and their right to life. But if we're just the product of two billion years of survival of the fittest, then does anything really matter? We might need to pretend to go along with our government's laws so that they don't jail or execute us, but there really is no right or wrong if there's no God and no purpose. If we can dispose of other human organisms to take their stuff, to get their power, Aren't we just proving that we're more fit to survive than they are? There are people who actually think like that. And if you really don't believe in God, it's probably the right way to think. <laughs> but I do, and I think life cries out, and our very world shows that there is a purpose and a design. Another thing you might think about, all of our bodies, the bodies of animals, the bodies of plants, are they the clear product of various random things that took place, and like some of what they uh, have works, like maybe a, a creature might have three or four or five feet, but only two actually work to walk. Is that the way life goes? It is not. We see creatures where nearly everything clearly has a purpose, and the things that maybe don't is stuff we just don't understand yet. All things seem to work extremely effectively. They have the muscles, the bone structure, the roots if they're a plant, the leaves, whatever they need to do their job. That's what they have and nothing else. Evolution doesn't specify that. It says that you'd have all kinds of things that are part way evolving to getting better and other things that used to work and they don't work anymore. I mean, if you just try to find like a stick to do a certain job, maybe you want to go find a stick to uh, um, roast hot dogs on or to, uh, you know, do some function. Maybe you need like a fork to uh, shovel up hay and you find a stick with a few branches. Invariably, there are going to be a lot of parts of that stick that 
really don't do what you need. They may not have a very good handle. Um, that may have other sticks, other branches sticking off at some place that you have to break off. When you take random things not intended for a job, there's all kinds of things that aren't what you want. When you get a tool that's designed for a job, well then nearly all of it is what you need. Well, it's obvious from life that it is designed because everything that animals have works and serves their needs very, very well. Okay. But it's sad. We do see a lot of people who are raised on these evolutionary ideas. Even college classes go through these things, but they don't explain it in these clear terms of what is the real meaning of life if we've just evolved. I think it probably leads to a lot of drug use and a lot of suicide among young people that we see so common because there doesn't seem to be any purpose to life if you believe we're just random chance. And consider this, if indeed we are chance, does it really matter if some bacteria or virus or evil person takes over and destroys the human race? If it's all survival of the fittest, don't we just kind of have to say, well, I guess that was the next thing that was more fit. So it's a very sad and difficult road to walk. Okay, but if we're created in God's image, well, then we have a purpose. We intend to answer the big questions from the Bible. And you might say, well, why are we going to answer from that book? Isn't it just like historical myth and all that kind of stuff? Well, we'll talk about that in another video. But for right now, just consider this much. If God were smart enough to create the world and everything that's in it, wouldn't he be smart enough to make sure that his word was available to everybody? I think the answer is obvious. He is, and he did. An estimated 6 billion copies of the Bible have been printed in all the world's major languages. The Wycliffe Bible Associates plan to finish translating the Bible into every language on earth by 2050. And I'm talking about little islands that have only a few hundred people that have a unique language are going to get a written language and a translation of the Bible. So the Bible is everywhere, more than everything else. And every copy of the Bible has the same 66 books in it. Now, there's arguments. There's some who add apocryphal stuff, other things. There were Bible translators who didn't like certain books, but they put them in anyway. There's actually several different sets of add-ins, but virtually every Bible ever published has the same basic 66 books that have been around there for probably 1,700 years for sure, and probably all the way back to the first century when the New Testament was written. As far as the Old Testament, we've got a part of every book except Esther in the Dead Sea Scrolls, showing that those books existed, what all scholars virtually agree, is at least a hundred years before Jesus. And Jesus and the apostles quoted from those books, so we can be relatively certain that Jesus and the apostles thought that the Old Testament that we have today is the Old Testament that was originally written and those people quote those books like they were the words of God handed down by God. So if you can believe and see the New Testament, that confirms the Old, and we are sure that we've got God's instruction. Now there's other religious books. I have a bunch here that some people would consider the words of God. We've got Korans, we've got the Bahava Gitas, we've got various different American cult books, the Book of Mormon, etc., but I think, uh, you know, we can do another video sometime and we'll talk about those and why they don't clearly seem to be the words of God. There's a good question here. Has the Bible already reached the world through the Christian churches in their missions and preaching? And in a word, the answer is no. I think if you've been around very long or gone to many churches or looked at many different uh, online Bible teachers, you'll find that... Uh, they vary quite a bit. And to be honest with you, most church groups have a doctrinal statement and the people who teach for them aren't allowed to really deviate from that. So even if they read and they study and they find things that are different, they have the choice of either continuing to teach what their group teaches or, or going somewhere else. And unfortunately, most of them kind of opt for uh, continuing to do what they do. Not always, but what I'm just saying is um, the Bible is a book that God promises to show us what it means and that we need to study it and read it individually. 
And unfortunately, there have been a lot of groups who've kind of made it a business or a party, a political, you know, association that we're the right group, bravo for us. And so sometimes we have struggled with that. A lot of people are doing it well-meaning, but nevertheless, no, I can't sit here and tell you that, that churches are the answer, and that they all teach the same thing or they all teach the scripture accurately. They do some good. Uh, they've done me lots of good. They've probably done you some good. They've cared for the poor. They've helped people in times of need. So I certainly don't um, take away from all the good works that have been done by Christianity. But as far as have they uniformly taught the Bible, no, they haven't. There are some biblical doctrines that are very important to a church. You have to believe it to be a member there. And like the main words of those doctrines aren't even in the Bible anywhere. So, <laughs> you know, we have those things. So anyway, if you've had a bad experience with the church, that doesn't mean that the Bible isn't going to be interesting and helpful to you. And you might say, well, why has God ever allowed that in his church? Well, it's the same answer to why is our world otherwise messed up from the wars and fightings and all the various evil that take place among tribes and governments. God has given free will to a lot of mankind within certain limits, but nevertheless free will. And free will means the ability to do bad and then see the results of that bad. If God were to slap us and stop us, you know, every time we did the least little thing bad, every time we called somebody a name or thought something bad or took somebody else's cookie or something, well, then life just wouldn't really be life. It'd be like living in a continual jail, you know, where everything is uh, suddenly corrected and you don't ever get to see the results of what you do or what you think. So God has given a lot of freedom, and so mankind has made a lot of mistakes, and even within churches, he has given a lot of freedom, and mankind has made a lot of mistakes. So, wow, why, though, let's go answer this question, am I, Norman Edwards, deciding that I need to teach this. I don't have advanced degrees or anything, and so how do I know? Why should you listen to this as opposed to anything else? Well, I'll tell you why I'm doing it, and tell you a little bit about myself, and then you can decide. But this time, we're going to actually go to the scripture and read here. So let's start in Ephesians 4, um, verses 7 and 11. And this is from the ESV. That's a translation, and we start here in Ephesians 4. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So there are some people that God has given as teachers. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of him. Okay, so here we have some of the spiritual gifts that the Bible talks about in many places. And he talks about there are teachers and there are people who've been given the spirit of wisdom and the revelation of knowledge. I believe Jesus Christ is still giving those gifts to this day. There are certainly people in the first century that have had them. There are people who've had them all through. And uh, if they have those gifts, well then they're almost utterly required by God to use them. Let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So, I am using this gift right now to teach you. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. I do this on my own. I'm not part of an organization. I don't have anything to join, a doctrinal statement to accept, an organization, a ministry, a corporation. I don't have any of that. But I'm saying that this is my understanding that I've acquired over the years, and I've prayed about it and really believed over the last couple of years that this is what God wants me to do, and I'm going to do it to benefit you and thousands, millions, whoever knows, how many others like you who want access to God. And you have access to him through prayer, his written word, and through Bible teachers. Okay, so all that being said, though, you have a reasonable request, I think, to say, well, where did you get this? How did you study? Where did you learn? How did all that go? And so I'll give you my life in a nutshell here. Um, I spent my first 18 years growing up. Now, sometimes my wife and friends will dispute that, but I kind of think I did. And then the next 18 years, I worked for a big church organization. And who it was isn't important. It's kind of gone by the wayside now. 
And I realized that it was a big mistake. The church taught largely that it was the only one that was right, maybe a possible a few other groups like it or something. I realized that God lets us live in mistakes for a long time so that we understand the gravity of this thing and how it deceives people. I know people who are still in the same mistake after 30 or 40 years and others who got out of it much more quickly than I did. But um, no, there's not some one church group that owns God and has the right to say, well, you are destined for eternal life and you're one of the good people and then you people over there, you're not destined for eternal life and uh, you're going somewhere bad. No, a man doesn't get that job. God gets that job. So I realized that at the time, but I learned from it. I read the Bible while I was there a couple of times through. I learned a lot of things that were good, but I also realized that I've made a mistake, and if that's helpful to you, if you've made some big mistake for decades, now's the time to change it. Don't continue in it just because you've been there, and God won't forsake you or forget you because you have. He loves you, and he wants to help you, and when you actually try to change the things in your life that God wants you to change and that you realize were real mistakes, then he's going to be there and help you out. Now, to continue... I met my wife in this group and benefited immensely. They taught people to stay pure before marriage and to be faithful afterward. We've now been married 37 years, have four wonderful children and eight grandchildren. It's a huge blessing. We have good relationships with all of them. Okay, so that was a mistake being in that group for 18 years. And then I spent two more years in a smaller but similar kind of church organization. And there I was the secretary of the board of directors and on their doctrinal committee. And I got a really good inside look at how church organizations actually run a lot of times. And I realized more of the mistakes. And for a while I really didn't even know what to do. But I started reading the Bible and saying, yeah, the biggest criticism that Jesus had of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the organized religion of his day, was that they operated more like political parties than the spirit-driven, spiritual gift-driven church that one sees in the New Testament. After two years of that, I realized it was time to move on and wasn't even sure what I was moving on to, but began to meet at home in houses with other people. And you know, in the New Testament, you find people meeting in their own homes for church, and you actually never find them building a building. They rented one once, but... The Bible doesn't say you can't build a building, but the idea that a church is a building, or you have to have a building to have a church, oh, well, certainly isn't in the New Testament. So, I started meeting in homes with other believers, and then for 10 years I published a Bible teaching newsletter and had a ministry to people, and wrote hundreds of articles and answered hundreds of questions from the Bible. Again, it was a small individual thing, there never was a corporation that um, um, just operated independently, and um, it was a good thing. Lots of different people wrote for the publication and uh, we shared a lot of ideas. Some were wrong. I've learned some things since then, but I was very happy for what was able to be accomplished at that time. And then, after that, I spent 14 more years running a Christian community and homeless shelter ministry. During that time, we had 639 people stay with us, gave them shelter, food, Bible teaching five days a week, and help with their next step in life. During those 14 years, we had an hour Bible study meeting for the staff five days a week, plus church during the weekends. Well, that was a massive time of Bible study for 14 long years. Well, I could talk all day about running the homeless shelter and all the things I learned there and the people we helped and those that we didn't. And, but um, if you're interested, you can check it out at portaustin.net slash pabc. That's the website. The Details of what happened and all 639 people's stories with no names are there. Anyway, it's a couple clicks away to find that, but it's in the list about the homeless shelter. So, let's finish though. 14 years, Christian community and homeless shelter, and then we moved to Nashville. My wife and I uh, had to kind of recover my health, spending an awful lot of late nights up working in the homeless ministry. And so now we get to spend time with our grandchildren and... Uh, I've been preparing for this ministry. I am 64 years old, as of probably exactly right now, and uh, want to share my lifetime learning and experience so I can bless you. And I think that's a good thing for both of us. Now, I suppose before we go, I should answer the question, why should you listen to me if I don't have an advanced degree? 
And again, we're going to go to the Bible to explain this one. Uh, most people feel they should have a doctorate of theology or somebody who's, uh, um, you know, done some big massive thing, maybe, you know, big multi-million dollar institution. Well, and that's not always bad. There are good things there, but it's not essential. And so let's read from the Gospel of John. This is chapter 7, verses 14 to 18. And there it says, and this is from the English Standard Version, ESV, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning, when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and in him there is no falsehood. So Jesus is saying, yes, that if you speak the glory of the one who sent him, which is of course God, the Father, that's the way it should be. So, I'm not Jesus. I could make mistakes. There's no question about that. But I certainly do seek the glory of God, not my own. I don't have an organization, a corporation, a following, a church, a doctrinal statement, or any of that stuff. Just a YouTube channel and a website. And uh, that's what I intend to do. Jesus had no human credentials from the religious leaders of his day. He only had about 120 followers on that first Pentecost. Uh, most of them had run away when he was crucified. So, But he changed the world. Oh, there's been no more important figure throughout all history. So anyway, Jesus, yes, he had no credentials from the religious leaders of his day. But he said that those who really were seeking God's will would understand that Jesus was the one who had what they needed. And so similarly, I hope people watching these videos will ask God and say, okay, is this God's will for me to listen to this person? And I think God will show you if you seek with your whole heart and are interested in what is good. And there are other teachers and other places and other ministries and other things that you can be involved with where God will show you if you seek him. Let me ask you a question just a moment. We read that part in there about Jesus was teaching at the feast. What is that feast where Jesus was teaching? Have you ever attended a Christian feast? Have you heard of teaching there? I have taught at such feasts for almost the last 25 years. So I think it's just interesting. Why was Jesus teaching on that day? And what did he teach? We certainly will have a video on that someday. Moving on, let's consider Jesus' apostles. Did they have credentials from the religious institutions of their time? And we'll run out to the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 8, 11, and 13. I'm certainly happy for you to read all the fill-in details, but we're just going to hit the spots that are really important here, and you see them there on your screen. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Now when they, the rulers that is, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So we have the same issue coming with Jesus' followers. They didn't go to the big schools and they were considered uneducated common men. And I suppose to some degree I'm an uneducated common person. I did get a bachelor's degree in business and take theology courses, but um, um, no, I don't have any advanced degree from a recognized institution. While that's a blessing to some people, I believe that God has shown me through his spirit and through my many years of study that it is the time to teach and time to be a blessing to other people. So boldness of the spirit, that's what the apostles had and that's how they got through. There are people in the New Testament that did have such a powerful education. The Apostle Paul had the best education of his time. Acts 22.3 says he was taught at the feet of Rabbi Gamaliel. Now who was he? Well according to the Jewish Mishnah um, in the tractate Avot 1, kind of verse 6 in there, it's a similar sort of system, Gamaliel was the leading sage of that time through a long series of Jewish sages. I have a Mishnah right there on the bookshelf, and um, the Talmud is commentary on the Mishnah. So I'm just saying, as Paul was a student of a person who was probably acknowledged as the Jews to be the leading 
rabbi of that time. And so he did have a great education from the secular point of view, but as he says in those other verses, that he didn't really count those things as anything important, but he counted what he had learned from Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit as where he based his teaching. Where do we go from here? What's our next step? Well, I would encourage you to think about the purpose of life more than about short-term economic goals, or maybe even long-term goals, or, or more than, well, what's fun to do today. And the fact that you've listened this far shows that you are thinking. Well, keep it up. Listen to other places. Study other places. Continually think about the all-important question. Was my life created for a purpose, or did the universe and me just somehow randomly happen along? A lot of people get through life and they never think about that, or never very much. And it is the important question, because if we do have a purpose, well, what is that purpose? And who put us here and why? And what are the rules and what are the suggestions and what is good for us to do and what's bad? And then I would encourage you to pray. The Bible actually shows that all kinds of people prayed to God in sincerity and received answers. Some of them weren't Christians. Some of them didn't even understand the God of the Old Testament. But there are places where people prayed. If you've ever seen somebody with a Prayer of Jabez t-shirt or a book, there's just a couple of verses there in Chronicles in a long list of genealogies about a man who prayed and received what he asked from God simply because he asked God in faith and he asked for a good thing. Don't ask God just to fit into your plans, but ask how you can fit into God's plans. Sometimes you need to ask God for a sign to show you through some sort of quiet, miraculous way. I mean, don't ask him to cut Jupiter in half or something. Maybe he wasn't planning to do that just for you. But in some quiet, miraculous way, there's a lot of people who do that. And God has shown people signs of what he's going to do. You work it out with him. There's no magic, magic formula, but sincerity and truth is everything. And then let me encourage you to read the Bible. Get a translation. We'll have a video about Bible translations. But whatever you have, start in the Old Testament and read through, or start in the New Testament. Either one has value. The New Testament is about only a quarter of the length of the whole Bible, so it's a little easier to get going. And then finally, well, should you attend a church? Well, probably. It's good to have like-minded people around you. It's good to have friends that come from people with an interest in God rather than friends that are mostly of secular interest or maybe trying to cheat you or get something from you, or you've, I'm sure you've experienced that somewhere. Not that you won't find that in the church. Be careful there. But there are places that are exactly what was intended by the church. People that love each other, want to encourage each other, want to share things, share their lives with each other. Those are good things. So I recommend you try a multitude of churches and see what's there. I can't recommend any particular brand or denomination because there's more variance between individual congregations of a certain group than there is between the groups themselves. And I kind of have the tendency just to go to totally non-denominational Bible churches, ones that allow people to participate and ask questions. That's something that you find in the New Testament. Uh, most of the New Testament is about people asking Jesus questions. He's got a couple of long messages, but nothing really huge. Most of it is questions and answers. So look for a congregation that has that. And you can pray and ask God to show you what's best. So finally, I'll just say that I like questions. If you want to ask a question at the bottom of this video, go ahead and do it. And I will be making more videos. I've got a list of 40 or 50, something like that, of uh, things I want to get started on and more things that I've written in the past that would make good teaching lessons. But I'm interested in your question and what you might want me to go into and cover. So, may God bless you and strengthen you, strengthen your study, give you hope, give you encouragement, and just bless you with all that he has for you and all that he's planned. Thanks for listening and I uh, hope you'll pick up and look at some of my channel and find other things that can be a blessing to you. Bye-bye for now.